Coming up, one year later. When the vaccine becomes available, how long will we have to wear masks? We'll take a look at the lessons learned during the pandemic and what we need to know moving forward. Then spring ahead, we'll have a history behind daylight saving time explained. Also, Paw Patrol. We'll get an update from the White House on a minor incident involving Major Biden. And inspiring kids will introduce you to these young scientists who are leading the way. It's okay to be smart. It's okay to be a nerd. This is NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. I'm Lester Holt. It's always great to be with you. We've got a great lineup ahead for you guys, including some remarkable students that we can't wait for you to meet. But we want to begin with one of the top stories we've been covering now for one year, and that's the coronavirus. Today, March 11th, marks one year since the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus outbreak a pandemic, meaning affecting a large amount of people worldwide. We know it's been a tough year. Most of us started working from home, going to school from home, and adjusting our activities to keep ourselves and our families safe. Our friend Dr. John Torres takes a look back now on what we've learned and how we've adjusted to our way of life. One of the most important things we've learned this year is how to keep ourselves healthy, both physically and mentally. We've been physically protecting ourselves by wearing masks, washing our hands, eating healthy, and getting enough sleep every night. We've been mentally protecting ourselves by being creative while in quarantine, learning new things, and talking with our friends and family about how we're feeling, whether they're happy, sad, or nervous feelings. We've learned how to safely see our friends and family. A few things to remember when meeting up. Try to gather outdoors rather than indoors. Always wear your mask and pick activities that allow for social distancing. What does it mean that a virus is mutating? Right now, there are three main variants in the U.S. The U.K. variant, the South Africa variant, and the Brazil variant, all named after the places they were first discovered. This can sound scary, but it's a very normal thing for viruses to change. It's important that scientists find these changes so we can adjust our behavior and the vaccines if needed. The ones that we watch out for are the ones that can escape our immune system or can somehow prevent us from getting rid of it as quickly. Those are the ones that we're on the watch for right now. Will there be a vaccine for children? The good news is we have multiple coronavirus vaccines and more on the way. Since so many people were trying to create a vaccine, scientists were able to make them in record time. Right now, the vaccine is for people 16 and older, but doctors are studying it in children to make sure it's safe and effective for them too. Some older kids, especially those with underlying medical conditions like asthma or diabetes, may be able to get the vaccine before school starts next year. Our question is, can dogs get the coronavirus and do they need the vaccine? We know animals can get coronavirus. We've seen lions and tigers at the zoo catch it, as well as a few cats and dogs, but it doesn't happen very often. And researchers have not seen any pets give coronavirus back to humans. A vaccine for animals is being studied, and several great apes at the San Diego Zoo have received it. But until it's available to all animals, you want to keep your pets safe, just like you would any other family member. Always wash your hands after playing with them and help your dog practice social distancing from other people when on walks. When the vaccine becomes available, how long will we have to wear masks? And finally, one of the most important things we've learned, masks are one of our most powerful tools against COVID-19, which is why until a majority of people get a vaccine, we need to keep wearing our masks to protect ourselves and our families and friends. Joining us now with more is our pal, Dr. John Torres. And Dr. John, we know one of the nation's top health agencies, the CDC, just released new guidelines regarding adults who have already received the vaccine and spending time with their families. And we know you guys want to know about hanging with your grandparents. So, Dr. John, what can you tell us about it? Well, one of the main things they said, and they use the example of grandparents, if your grandparents have been fully vaccinated, then you can come from your house to their house, or they could go to your house as well, and you can hug, you can do the things you want to do without having to wear a mask or social distancing. But it can be a little bit confusing because if you go out in public, even though you don't have to wear a mask inside the house with your grandma or grandpa, when you go out in public, you're going to need to put one on. So are they to keep yourself and everybody else protected. 
Well, I can't wait to see a certain couple of uh, grandchildren as soon as I get my shots, Dr. John. And while we have you, we also just received a new question from one of our viewers about the pandemic. Here it is. Hi, my name is Ezra, and I live in Philadelphia, and I just lost a tooth. My question is, how will a tooth fairy come during the pandemic? Thank you, NBC and I'm sure this is awesome. Well, Dr. John, what about the tooth fairy? You know, this is actually a great question because kids want to know, if I lose a tooth, put it under the pillow, will the tooth fairy take it away and leave that special gift for me? And the answer is yes, even in the midst of the pandemic, because the tooth fairy is protected from the virus. But just to make sure, the tooth fairy is also taking some special precautions. They're going to wear a mask when they come in your room. And on top of having their magic wand, we think they also have magic dust that they can spray over the pillow. That way, they don't need to touch anything. The tooth automatically goes into their tooth bag and the gift goes under your your pillow but just to make sure you want to make sure that you're asleep the whole time that way the tooth fairy doesn't have to get near you they can protect you themselves and all the other kids that are going to visit that night well i'm glad we've settled that question dr john torres thanks as always my friend and parents just a reminder if your child has a question about any topic email a video to us at nightly news kids at nbcuni.com and we'll try to answer them in an upcoming show now let's turn to another story in the news this week regarding President Biden's dog, Major. Our friend Kristen Welker has details. Hi, Lester. You could say we've been on Paw Patrol here at the White House, digging to get to the bottom of what happened between a Secret Service agent and President Biden's young German shepherd named Major. Presidential pooch Major Biden has gone from the White House to the dog house after he was involved in an incident at his new home on Monday. A Secret Service official tells NBC News the dog nipped an agent's hand but didn't break any skin. The press hounding the administration for answers. Major was surprised by an unfamiliar person and reacted in a way that resulted in a minor injury to the individual. The three-year-old dog is now back at the Biden family home in Delaware for a previously scheduled and short-term stay. But the White House signaling it won't be long before he's playing fetch again on the South Lawn. The dogs will return to the White House soon. The Bidens adopted Major from the Delaware Humane Association in 2018, later becoming the first shelter dog to live at the White House, gaining the attention of the paparazzi. Experts say the new digs likely playing a factor. Major didn't do this because he's a shelter dog. <laughs> he did this because he was a dog under um, an elevated level of stress and was pushed over his threshold. I would say Major's path back, back to the White House just might involve some training uh, with his trainer um, and also managing him in the house differently. Still, despite all the canine commotion, first pets are a treasured tradition at the White House and likely will be forever. I'm told that Secret Service agent who was nipped was immediately back on the job and is doing just fine. And the Biden White House hasn't gone totally to the dogs. In fact, the president wants to bring a cat to the White House at some point too. Press Secretary Jen Psaki predicting that new addition will break the internet. Lester. Kristen, thanks. Well, this weekend marks daylight saving time. It's when we move the clocks forward one hour and we lose an hour of sleep. Here to explain it is our friend, WNBC weather anchor Dave Price. Hey, Dave. Hey, Lester. Let's start off with a question. When do you get more sure. done? During the day or overnight? I get, well, much more during the day. I've, I've, I've got my whole day laid out. So the more sunshine, the more time, the better. You got it. So let's talk a little bit about daylight saving time. It's coming up this Sunday at 2 a.m., and it's every year at this time the second Sunday in March. We leap forward and we move the clocks ahead one hour. And then on the first Sunday in November, every year we fall back and we move the clocks right back one hour. The shift matches the change in seasons. So why do we do that? Well, it's a long story and it started a long time ago, but I'm gonna tell you about it. It boils down to this. Many people think it's a better use of daylight hours or the time we have when the sun is up in the sky. So let me tell you a little bit about the history. Before any country adapted it, two small towns that are now known as Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada, tried it all the way back in 1908 because they thought 
it would be better for people to have more daylight hours to do fun things outside after working all day. It's like you having more playtime in the sunlight after school, but before bedtime. Then, in 1916, Germany, the whole country, adopted daylight saving time, but they did so because they believed it would save fuel and energy. Now, just think about it. Before we start the day in the morning, before the sun comes up, it's colder, and you need to use more energy and heat to be comfortable. It's also dark, so you have to turn on the lights. But you can save energy when it's warmer inside and out, and the sun provides us with natural light. Now, in the United States, we started using daylight saving time in 1918. But it wasn't farmers who wanted to do this because their day is driven by the sunrise and sunset, regardless of what time it says on the clock. It was people who owned factories and businesses who thought this was a good idea. But what's really interesting about the way our country does it is not every state takes part. Arizona and Hawaii never change their clocks. So that's a little bit about daylight saving time. It starts this Sunday at 2 a.m., except if you're in Hawaii or Arizona. The days are gonna be filled with more daylight hours, and now we can count down to spring and then summer. Lester, we'll send it back to you. That was a great explanation. I'm warning everybody I'm gonna be a little cranky the first few <laughs> days of daylight saving because that you know, losing that extra hour of sleep, but it's well, well worth it. You bet. All right, let's turn now to our Inspiring Kids series. We know some of you are aspiring scientists, engineers, and mathematicians. So we want to introduce you to a few teenagers who are doing some really cool things. They're building solutions to real-world problems, and all are finalists in an annual competition. We know when it comes to subjects like science and math, it can be a bit intimidating. But some older kids are leading the way, hoping they can change your mind. Meet 17-year-old Deja Taylor. She's on a mission to change the world. I love science so much because there aren't any clear answers. The Iowa City team created a unique remedy to help doctors in developing countries. Sutures are stitches. So when you cut yourself like really, really deep and you have to go to the doctor, um, the doctor will pull out this like thread and it'll hurt a lot. The tangible thread is called a suture. Deja uses beet juice to dye the sutures, which change colors when an infection is detected. So our skin is naturally acidic, having a pH of around five. And when our wounds are infected, the pH increases to about eight or higher. Deja is a finalist along with these other students in the Regeneron Science Talent Search, the oldest science and math competition for high school seniors in the country. Hi, my name is Vivian Yi. Vivian Yi from Michigan decided to tackle a challenge facing all of us the coronavirus. When the COVID-19 pandemic kind of hit, I was really disheartened to see the disproportionate impact that the toll had had on like underprivileged communities, low income communities and communities of color. The 17 year old created math equations to explore how the virus spreads. She studied how people live, their education and economic status to understand why some communities are impacted more than others. I was able to create a new approach to studying how infectious diseases impact communities with different levels of social vulnerability that's more comprehensive than um, the current models that we have now. For Edgar Sosa, his project hits close to home. It's not easy to leave your country. He immigrated from Guatemala after his family lost their coffee farm to something called coffee rust. Coffee rust is a fungus that has been killing coffee for several years now. Edgar studied how to kill a similar fungus using a copper-based particle and hopes to one day test this in Guatemala. Now, their advice to aspiring scientists? No one should be afraid of getting involved in science. It's okay to be smart. It's okay to be a nerd. It is okay to um, showcase your talent in um, educational ways. And never doubt like what you can accomplish and never feel like there's something that you can't um, achieve. Because when you start out a project, it all starts with like that good idea and having the determination to be able to see it through. 
Wow. Kudos to all of you. Some really, really smart folks there. Finally, as I mentioned earlier on the show, today, March 11th, marks the one-year anniversary of the pandemic. And despite all the challenges, us adults want you to know just how proud we are of you guys. You all had to adjust pretty quickly to a new normal. You've been brave. You've inspired us and given us hope. One day, years from now, you might look back at this time and say to yourself, I remember the masks, the social distancing, Zoom, and remote learning. We know this past year has been tough. You missed your friends, hugging, grandma, and just being a kid. School went remote overnight. When I heard that we weren't going back to school, like in person, I was sad. But I'm excited that I still get to see my new friends and teacher. Birthday parties turned into drive-by parades. Museums got creative. And families welcomed new furry friends into their homes. Yes, it's really fun. Yeah. Cool. They thought this would just be a great time because we're usually so busy. But despite all the challenges, acts of kindness emerged. We cheered for the heroes in scrubs and the everyday heroes who kept us going. We also cheered for kids who inspired us, like pilot TJ Kim, who flew much needed supplies to hospitals in Virginia, or these sisters from Staten Island who sewed masks for frontline workers. It feels really good knowing that we can help people during this time when there's not much to do to help. And now, one year later, there seems to be some good news. And a couple of things we know for sure. Knowledge gives us power. Hope makes us stronger. And together is how we're getting through this. Well, that's going to do it for us. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time. And remember, take care of yourself and each other.